Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have uh, a wonderful scholar, Seth Bernstein, here with us today. Seth is Associate Professor of History of the Soviet Union and post-Soviet states at the University of Florida. Um, he has a book published already about the Komsomol. Um, and his most recent book, which is brand new, which is what we're going to hear about today. I'm very excited that I have the physical mm -hmm. object right here, arriving for the first time in New York City, returned to the motherland, displaced Soviets in World War II and the Cold War. We're going to hear about this very exciting research. Seth, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Um, thank you, and it's really nice to, to see you again, see everyone on Zoom. I see some names that I, I recognize, so it's great that um, you can come in here. And let me thank Sonia's Potomac as well for organizing the the whole um, event, even though she, I don't know if you see her maybe on the computer. She's not class today. Uh, but... Well, I like to think that she's listening in. Uh, <laughs> class being very rude. And also, you know, I'll just say I want to very... Uh, you know, lots of precious for very ceremoniously say this for and I uh I mean hope that we share it with Jordan Center people no. maybe you can read it. No, absolutely not. <laughs> only for him. Only for him. Um, All night. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and I'll pass it around. Um there Thank you. You. Yeah. So um then let me start classic phrase. Let me start by sharing my screen. Um so this uh, paper comes from a chapter in the book. It's chapter 10, if you're keeping track. It's um, an unusual chapter in a book that's about displaced persons, migrants to the Soviet Union, mostly in the wartime period. The main focus of the book is about Soviet people who are taken as forced laborers, as POWs, or went to German-occupied Europe um, because they were fleeing Soviet forces. And much of the book talks about the efforts to return them, their own efforts to go back or not to go back, and the way that changed Soviet conceptions of uh, who belonged to the Soviet Union, who was a Soviet subject, and who was not. And so this chapter in the book, the last chapter, picks up on that with the, a bit of a strange group, people who weren't just um, part of the wartime diaspora, where people had left the Soviet Union during 1941 to 45, but who are part of the broader Soviet diaspora. Um, and specifically, we're talking about Ukrainians, Ukrainian diaspora, mostly. Um, what I like most about this research, I really had fun writing this book um, in the archives of Russia and Ukraine. It allowed me to explore a lot of stories of unusual people, people who were between states, um, people who made interesting connections who came from Ukraine and went to Germany or went from Germany to Argentina and back to Ukraine, that sort of thing. And the first person uh, I'd like to mention, uh, someone who's going to be a character that runs throughout this talk, is Alberto Pavluk. So, it's going to work for me. Alberto Pavluk, yeah. self-portrait. Um, yeah, yeah he's, he had a lot of... Uh, Talent. He had a lot of talent and also <laughs> a lot of um, self regard. <laughs> so, um, so, Paul Luke was born in Argentina in 1936 to a family of Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, who had come to Argentina from interwar Poland. In 1956, he came with his family to Odessa via Lutsk. And according to some sources, Pavluk was um, not expecting to stay in the Soviet Union. He thought he was going on tourism. Depends on who, you know, what source he used. You know, the KGB says he wasn't, and he later said he was, you know, a tourist. Um, he found, though, that he was considered a re-emigrant. So someone who had left the Soviet Union or was a part of family that left the Soviet Union and was coming back um, to settle forever in the Soviet Union. Once there, he found he could not exit, even though he was an Argentinian citizen, uh, without permission from Soviet authorities. He found that he was surveilled by Soviet authorities, and this, they found him in the 
um, Ukraine's Esbel Lorcai, who was surveilled by the KGB, uh, and his colleagues at the Odessa Art Institute, his fellow students, who denounced him for saying that his motherland is Argentina because he was born there and grew up there. His childhood friends were all there, and after all, life is good there. And you know, a little side note: apparently, you know, um, like who's a childhood friend of the Pope, the current Pope? There's something I read about that. Yeah, and he may still be. Yeah, the current Pope. The one who's alive. The one who's alive today. Yeah, yeah, the Argentine Pope. Um, so kind of a strange connection there too. Now I'll talk more about Pablo later, but for now, you know, the question is, why did Soviet authorities want someone like this? Why did someone want, uh, why did they want an Argentinian, someone who had never been to the Soviet Union? He spoke Ukrainian, but he wasn't someone who you would think of as a Soviet citizen. And he certainly wasn't someone who was the target of the 1955 campaign, again in 1955, called Return to the Motherland, that targeted the wartime diaspora. Um, it seems puzzling why they would want Pavluk after the interwar period where the emigre community wasn't someone that Soviet Union targeted, it was someone they kind of left alone. They were indifferent um, to at least to bringing them back to the Soviet Union. They didn't think of them as a natural, um, a natural population to attract. So the question is, where does this um, idea that the diaspora is actually Soviet come from? Well, I found this campaign emerged and built off of repatriation efforts from the 1940s that um, turned the Soviet wartime diaspora into an ethno-national understanding of what Soviet citizenship meant. It ties in with um, broader European notions of the time and from the 19th century of um, the idea that states, that their, their national community belongs to them, and that reverse migration is something that is um, desirable. So in places like uh, Eastern European countries or even Italy, thinking about people whose ties to the nation are somewhat tenuous, tenuous maybe were born there, um, but nonetheless are seen as people who belong to that state. Um, and emerging out of World War II, you have the Soviet Union considering itself a great power that deserves to have its people come back to the USSR. Not only the wartime diaspora, but the broader diaspora of people who are from um, Soviet territories, so the titular nations of these uh, republics, which allows them to, Ukraine, uh, to repatriate people who um, are Ukrainian, but maybe never lived in Ukraine, hmm. let alone the Soviet Union, or uh, you know, both. Now, the other thread in this um, in this story is economic economic migration. So you have this national ethnic logic to the to the campaign to return people from the diaspora, but there's also an economic logic. Khrushchev's rule is known for um, mitigating the Stalinist the worst excesses of Stalinism, making Stalinism um, lowering the heat on repression. But his economic reforms are also ambitious. He made material comfort a goal. So having people um, winning the Cold War by giving people a better quality of life. So the Soviet Union would win by giving people appliances, by giving them clothes, by giving them um, apartments. And the idea here is that if you can bring people over to the Soviet Union, show them a socialist world that um, is better than the capitalist world than they already know, you could win the Cold War that way. So in Ukrainian re emigres people like Pavlik, there was a seeming match. People who the Soviet state could claim on ethno-national grounds, and they could give the promise of a brighter future, a brighter, prosperous future. So in this talk, I want to give a um, broader history of this return to the motherland campaign in the context of post-war migration, and then talk about its particular unfolding in Ukraine. Um, let me see if I have a good, what's going on here? Yeah. So um, I'm going to give you the kind of broad view of my book uh, before going into chapter, in this chapter. During World War II, there were some 7 million people who ended up in German-occupied Europe and alive um, at the end of the war. Um, approximately, uh, they were 
forced labor as prisoners of war, or they migrated because they feared the USSR. Of them, about 5.6 million people came back. Some of them who didn't come back died. Some of them um, kind of disappeared, and it's unclear what happened to them. But a significant number um, stayed abroad. They became non-returners. Those who returned, many of them came back willingly. So I would argue that most of them came back willingly. Although it's kind of, you can never prove that. It's a somewhat contentious uh, point. And then some of them, especially POWs who thought that they were going to be repressed, and many of them were, um, were returned by force. Um, Soviet authorities treated them as traitors often, or at least suspect. Some six to eight percent were arrested upon return, and they were suspected their whole lives. Now, what happened to the, the remaining people, the non-returners? There was something like a half million of them who, refer, who refused to see themselves as Soviet subjects, and the Western allies agreed. So these are people um, from, there we go. These were mostly people from the Western areas of the Soviet Union, places that were annexed during the war. Um, the Western allies saw these annexations as illegitimate. The Soviets saw them as legitimate and therefore conflict. Who do the people from these territories belong to? The Western allies say that they don't belong to anybody. They can choose where they want to go. The Soviets say that they're ours. Um, what's interesting and telling and useful for this talk today is that the people they target as potential returnees are people from these, um, from the ethno-national titular nationalities. So Ukrainians, Belarusians, uh, Russians, and uh, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians. They don't want to, to get Jews back, even though they're from these territories. They don't part of them at all. They're not interested. Um, zero interest uh, because of they don't have an ethno national territory, despite Vera Bajan. Right? It's not, not on their radar. Um, instead, they're only interested in these Soviet nationalities. They sometimes kidnap them. Um, there are very interesting stories about the kidnappings that the Soviet authorities are not, Soviet higher ups in Moscow are very displeased about. <laughs> Um, because it's you know, created an international incident. Um, and more, more generally, trying to plead with them, come back to the motherland. The motherland um, will make you whole. You won't be whole outside of the motherland. We're going to treat you well, and you will um, find a family, right? find your actual family, but also this national family. Mm -hmm. um, amid this attempt to get the wartime diaspora back, there's another attempt to get the hundreds of thousands um, of emigrants who were in Europe. So they use this repatriation apparatus, the Soviet, uh, Soviet Repatriation Administration, to try to appeal to people who had been outside of uh, in Europe, but from Ukraine, from you know, interwar Poland. Um, I don't want to go through the whole campaign because it's not that interesting and it's not that useful or important. They don't get that many people. They get some several thousand. It costs a lot of money to get them. Um, and they're not really pleased with it because they get factory workers instead of like, intelligentsia. Um, but they, there's this effort to get the, the immigration back because I argue that there's a new concept, uh, conceptualization of who belongs in the Soviet Union. It's these people who are from the ethno national, uh, titular nationality, right? That we want these people, they belong to us, and they should be happy with us. Now, they don't do a very good job of getting them, or it's you know kind of a futile effort. It's hard to persuade people to come to the Soviet Union when they want, don't want to come, no matter how much um, you know national community you offer them. What changes things, or what reinvigorates efforts, is Stalin's death. After um, the the great mass of uh, the wartime gas were dispersed around the world. They go from Germany to other places. Um, in 1955, the uh, Soviet leaders decide that they're going to make a new push for, for these people. Um, it ties into the broader, broader um, effort under the collective leadership and under Khrushchev to mitigate the harshest aspects of Stalinism. So there are a bunch of amnesties that you probably know about um, under Stalin or after Stalin. And one of them is the amnesty of collaborators. So it's 1955, they issue the 
uh, Amnesty for Soviet Citizens who collaborated with the occupiers. It grants computations and total amnesties for people who committed nonviolent collaboration. So if you didn't shoot anybody or didn't participate in mass murder, you can get out of the gulag. Um, significantly, there's a point at the end of it that called for the easing of restrictions on immigration by people who had collaborated. And this is presumably um, to get those people who were afraid of coming back. They thought they would be accused of collaboration. They probably would have been, but now they can safely come back to the Soviet Union. Now, this paragraph was conspicuous because, let's see it, this is the next slide. Oh, sorry. Because in that same year, a new committee formed, the Committee for Return to the Motherland. Um, it was run, so it happens a little bit before the amnesty is issued. It's kind of a mysterious organization run by this general Nikolai uh, Filipovich Mikhailov, who was a POW during the war, he came back to the Soviet Union, was apparently unharmed, and then in 1955 is declared that he's going to run this committee that's um, based in Berlin and trying to get people to come back to the Soviet Union. They have a newspaper, it's in Russian, it's in Ukrainian, it's uh, it's height about coming out every two weeks. So it's a pretty substantial apparatus. Um, foreign newspapers treat it pretty seriously. They say, oh look, there's a Soviet effort to bring people back. Um, but many of the emigres saw it for what it was, which is a KGB front. It, it was very much run by the KGB and not by Mikhailov, who uh, at times I wondered if he was a real person. Um, <laughs> but I, I think he was. Um, and they got a, bit of a photograph, didn't they? So, uh, he was. He was a real person, but he was not running the show, I don't think. So part of this effort was a kind of psyops campaign against anti-Soviet emigres. Benjamin Tronley has written about this. I don't know if anyone's heard of his book. It's um, good CIA um, and the Russian immigration or something like that. I'm sorry if he's in the room and I'm butchering it. Uh, anyways, you'll find it. <laughs> so he took this campaign from the emigre side and it was very chaotic for them. It created a lot of distrust. People would defect from um, anti-Soviet anti-Soviet organizations back to the Soviet Union. I suppose it's not defection, it's kind of re-defection. And um, you know, it caused big rifts in that organization, those organizations. Now, the, the main goal, I would argue, of this campaign is not the PSYOP. It's one of the goals, clearly. But the real goal is to bring people back. You know, part of it's intelligence gathering about these organizations, but part of it's propaganda to show that the Soviet Union is better, that they have a home there. Now, the main um, group that's being targeted, looking at the time too, the main group that's being targeted is the wartime diaspora. And you can see it in the publication of this organization, but also in uh, media like People and Beasts, Ludi Zviri, which is a movie that comes out in 1962 about a POW who goes, he's in Germany um, in a you know, forced labor camp. Then he goes to Argentina because he's afraid of coming back after the war. Then he goes to Germany again, where he's working with capitalists, it's terrible. Then he comes back to the Soviet Union and he um, is afraid to approach his family. Eventually he does, his nephew makes contact with them and it's all, you know, it's a um, not completely happy ending, but a good ending. And he's starting to be reintegrated into Soviet society after years of fear. But he's this wartime diaspora. He's he's a, someone who was afraid. He's the target of these amnesties, of this amnesty. Um, but actually, he's not the main person who comes back. This is not the type of person who comes back. It's mostly people like Pavlik. So I think this is the next slide. I, so if you look at the people who returned in the 1950s, I have a database of about 8,000 people. So the KGB took lists of all the people. And I had my students at Vishka when I was working there. Um, I was very cruel to them. I made them make all the list into a database. Uh, and it turns out that something like half of the people came from Argentina. Many came from other Latin American countries like Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay. 
Uh, many came from Eastern Europe, so they were in Poland, and they married someone during the war, and then they came back, something like that. Um, many were in Western Europe, same kind of story, but it's really um, you know, a re-emigrate story, you can tell from the data, rather than a repatriate story. So it's not people who are coming back to the Soviet Union, but people who are entering the Soviet Union for the first time, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, and what I would say is that you can tell from this that there's an assumption that these people belong because of their background. There's this, um, there's a hope that it's going to be the wartime gas where it comes back, but in the failure of it to attract lots of people, they're happy to go with the people too on the list, which is just Ukrainians, um, as it turns out. So let me see if I'm here. Yeah. Um, so actually, I don't want that yet. Sorry, I'll leave you with the statistics. So why do these people um, come back? My sense is it's probably not this um, Soviet sense of nationalism or you know, national belonging that was foremost on their list, although that's probably um, part of it. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the main thing is economic opportunity, uh, I suspect. This is what Khrushchev's government portrayed it as. They, um, in the publication of the return organization, they put out articles where coal miners would give their budgets and say, look how good I'm doing. I have so much excess money per month. And meanwhile, they would put out articles about physicians who became taxi drivers and doctors, and, um, you know, professors who became janitors and that sort of thing, pretty standard, you know, eking out a wretched existence in camps. There were also um, the reason of leftist sympathy. So there was a re who um, came to Buenos Aires from Bolivia during the interwar period. He left maybe because of Stalinist repression, unclear. So it's at the time of the purge that he leaves for Buenos Aires. He doesn't come back after the war, which is a pretty good sign that um, something was going on that he didn't want to return to Soviet Ukraine uh, while Stalin was still in power, but he returns afterwards, um, after Stalin dies, probably because he felt some kind of leftist kinship. And a lot of the people were part of friendship organizations um, and has some kind of affinity for leftist politics as, as well as being nationally the target of, of this campaign. But many of the people um, had never been in the Soviet Union and they, or if they, um, so we're talking about people like Papu and his family, people who had gone to Argentina or somewhere else, mostly Argentina, and established lives, had children, um, and were bringing little Argentinians back with them. So of these people, of the you know, 4,000 some Argentinians, there were 900 families, about three and a half people per family on average. In some cases, really big families, like um, extended families. So there was one group, three brothers with their father, wives, children, 15 people, all settled in a village together. It increased the size of the village by, you know, double the size of the village, basically. Um, over a thousand of the people who came back had been, were born in South America. And many of them were teenagers or young adults, meaning that they were really, you know, Latin American. <laughs> there was a, a significant amount of their uh, lives that had taken place there that informed them. Um, and it's easy to imagine that for the parents, coming back to the homeland was attractive for, for some reason, for you know, this national reason. You want to raise them where you grew up. There was a writer named Yuri Slipukin who was part of the wartime diaspora. He was a forced laborer. He moved to Argentina, um, joined the, an anti-Soviet organization, and then eventually came back. But he wrote it, um, a novel about his experiences in Argentina. Um, in, in this novel, he had a girlfriend. It's a really weird novel because it's part um, trying to get Nazi war criminals. Like it's an adventure story about how they capture a Nazi war criminal, but also his thinking about, should I come back or not? It's part about thinking, should I come back or not? He had an Emily girlfriend. They're thinking about having a child, and he says, you know, at first, everything will be fine, but then he will go to school with a child. Then there will be a little Argentinian family with his own interests, different from his parents, and an internal world far removed from theirs. So I think that must be must have been going on in the minds of a lot of, of these um, Argentinian Ukrainians. But the dreams of bringing these um, Argentinian Ukrainians back and having them become Ukrainian crash against harsh realities, a lot of them didn't speak 
Russian or Ukrainian. And instead they were, um, they, yeah. they were in the Odessa port, looking longingly at the sea and hoping the Spanish sailors would come in and talk to them in Spanish. That's what the KGB reports say. <laughs> um, some of them were able to enroll in, in good schools like Pavluk. He enrolled in the Odessa Art Institute was quite successful, as you saw, um, you'll see more of. But others, they couldn't make it. They just didn't have the languages to enter higher education or even primary education. Um, so for every person, there are different constellations of reasons why they came back. National, political, economic. But I mean, all of them had these economic motivations, I would say. They all expected things to be good in the Soviet Union. They were promised apartments, jobs, money. Um, and that didn't come through. The consular officials sold them on it, and local officials had to answer for it, had to pay up. And the local officials often weren't willing to do it. Um, it was hard for the, the re-emigres because they didn't have local networks. You, you can imagine you come into a, a, um, a village or a town, you ask for an apartment, and the local party official or the person in the government says, well, no, I have a list this long, <laughs> and you're not on it. <laughs> Right? There's no national committee that's going to help them. The only national committee that's helping them is the KGB. <laughs> really. Um, now, other re emigres and repatriates, especially the re emigres, realized that the homeland they remember was not the one they returned to. So, if you can imagine a Ukrainian uh, from the interwar period leaves their village, goes to Argentina, it has this imagination of a, of a village with kind of pastoral views farms, that sort of thing. They returned to the Soviet Union 20 years later. What is it? It's a collective farm. It's not a multi-ethnic region of Ukraine anymore. You know, the Jews are gone. Poles are largely gone because they've been deported or executed. Um, and there's lots of collective farms and industrial settlements. It's a very different place. Um, and some were not happy with what they found. A lot of them chose their native village as the first place of settlement when they came back. That was a mistake for a lot of them <laughs> because they were frankly shocked by the poverty. There was a group, there's a, um, a family from Canada that came in. The father brought an outboard motor with him because he wanted to go motorboarding, They're like on that boat. boat. Um, so he had this kind of vision of what it was going to be like in, in Ukraine. And he was shocked. His daughter said that um, he cried when he, when he saw his village. It was the first time she saw him cry. And they ended up moving to Dnipropetrovsk because they could go boating, apparently, and they could find a job. And it was more of a normal urban life. Um, but they did not find the Ukraine that they expected, in short. They were not alone, this family. There were many of these memories who converged on cities, um, and the cities became overwhelmed. So. There were a lot of people like Pavluk who came to a place like Nutsk, and then they ended up in Odessa. So 90% of the people in Odessa province came to the city, and a quarter of those people um, were not registered as, as wanting to be there. They weren't supposed to be there. So they ended up having to rent apartments for high prices. They couldn't you know, even get on that the end of the local officials list because they weren't Odessans. Mm -hmm. um, so in short, we have the situation where the US are hope to offer a national homeland to them, economic stability, economic prosperity even. But those realities kind of shocked them and disappointed many and led some wanting to leave. Now, technically, they were all, many of them were um, Canadian citizens or Argentinians. And in the consulates, they were often promised, of course you can leave, you're a Canadian, you're an Argentinian. Of course, why, why wouldn't you be able to leave? They'll accept you back in your homeland, in your, your second homeland. Um, but in fact, oh wait, sorry, that's a, uh, I'm getting a little behind on my, my slides, but <laughs> economic motivations, there you go. All right, I'm gonna leave this up for now, and we'll go back to Papu. Um, But in fact, they had to have two documents. One, their passport from a foreign country, from Argentina or from Canada or wherever. And two, they had to have an exit permit. And the exit permit was the hard part. Soviet authorities were not willing to let someone like Alberto Pavlik out. Um, so how would they escape? How would they leave if they wanted to leave? They had to go to their embassy 
or that's where they decided to go. Oftentimes they would go to the Argentinian embassy, Canadian embassy, and say, we want help leaving. We need our passports back. We need you to, um, to apply pressure to the Soviet uh, government to let us out. And of course, the um, Soviet government didn't want to do that, saw them as Ukrainian, saw them as belonging to this country, really skeptical about their, their foreign allegiances. Um, some of them applied to go to Poland because they thought, you know, we were from interwar Poland. We have family there, still a lot of them did. So why can't we go to Poland? That would seem like a better option. But the KGB was also skeptical about that. They thought as a um, kind of a ploy to get to Argentina eventually or just escape you know, the Soviet um, you know, the Soviet Union overall. Um, in the face of these kinds of people, like Pavlyuk, who wanted to leave the Soviet Union, they started, the KGB, started to employ really elaborate schemes to try to stop them. So with Pavlyuk, here's what they did. They got an informant named Dimitruk, the Dimitruk, right, to go to the Argentinian embassy, and he had a hard case because he wasn't actually an Argentinian citizen. So they purposely sent someone who wasn't who had a bad uh, biography for Argentina that they knew that the consulate wouldn't let into wouldn't support. And then he would go back to Pavio, which he did, and give him the genuine news that they weren't supporting him. So when he told that to Pavio, Pavio responded, "You killed me with that. What should we do now? Accept everything and begin to set up our lives here." So, you know, this is elaborate disinformation going on, and it's not only him um, that they do this with. Now, when they weren't able to um, convince someone to stay or to dissuade them from trying to leave, discourage them, they started to arrest them. There's another case um, of what I really like, of a guy named Vasily Jose Trico. He's kind of like um, Pavluk in the sense that he grew up in Argentina. Um, comes to the Soviet Union with his family and almost immediately decides he wants to leave, but he can't. So he starts going to the embassy, he starts agitating to, to leave. Um, he foments a plan that the KGB called nomads to cross the Georgian border with Turkey. But the KGB knows about this because they have an informant named Tchaikovsky who's monitoring him, he's a friend, not a friend, <laughs> who tells the KGB all about the plan, they catch him, and Trico goes to jail for a year, to the gulag for a year, right? Doesn't stop Trico, he's really persistent. It's kind of amazing, it's um, inspiring in some ways, although also, as you'll see, not inspiring. So um, he was released in 1960, and the first thing he does is he goes to the Argentinian embassy again. Who comes with him? Tchaikovsky. <laughs> this trip has lots of ironic moments because they get on a plane from Odessa to Kiev and Trico, as they're um, refueling in, in Kiev, he says, let's not get off the plane because there could be informants out there or like agents are going to arrest us. So then they go to Moscow, go to the Argentinian embassy, and who do they see there? But two girls that they know, two you know, women, young women who are from Argentina as well, who want to leave. And Trico goes, you know, I think they're informants to be informant. Um, <laughs> So then they get an audience with the consul, and he, you know, Kriko says, you know, I think those girls were informants. And the informant goes, or the consul says, oh, really? But, um, you know, have you dated either of them? Or, like things are good with you? And he's like really interested in their like, sexual lives. It was kind of creepy. Um, Kriko was thinking that this hypervigilance would endear him to the consul. And he also told them about the try, try to escape through um, from Georgia to Turkey. But the consul says, you know, it sounds like a child's act to me. Like you should have just sat in your place and let us do our work. Um, you know, the meeting did not go well for Trico overall. He felt really discouraged after it. And yet he didn't stop trying to leave. So it, there are some things that you just couldn't solve with, um, with force for the Soviet, for Soviet authorities. Now, the most effective tactic was giving people more, um, more stuff. That's the only thing that could, it seems to have worked, or not the only thing, but that had to be there. If people wanted that, then it could work. So there's a family named the Subchuks, five people, 
came to read them uh, at the end of 1955. They didn't have an apartment of their own. The KGB manages to get them an apartment and they become happy, more or less. Another family um, tells it, or another fellow tells an informant that he had only gone to the Argentinian embassy because he wanted the KGB to know that he was displeased. The KGB learns about this from the informant and gives him an apartment. It works, right? Even though they can tell he's manipulating the system. Um, you know, this combination of threat and reward wore down many people. So if we return to Pablo, again, I keep on returning to him because I like him so much. I, I, um, how are we doing in time? Five minutes. Oh, man. Okay. So we're turning to Pablo. Um, so he decided by October 1960 that he was going to stay. They gave him an exit permit, actually, in October 1960. But he decided to show up to the KGB office, say, no, I'm staying. He had joined a youth brigade, one of those um, policing brigades in the Georgini. Um, he submitted his military draft card. But he seemed to be happy in part. You know, the KGB said, oh, we did a really good job of influencing him and giving him what he wanted and repressing him to some extent and you know, discouraging him and so on. But he really just met a, a woman, right? He met his wife. But what's um, really interesting about him, uh, after the book was published, my book, uh, I, I found a YouTube video with him from 2013 where he's complaining to Odessan uh, municipal authorities about they're not speaking uh, Ukrainian. So he became kind of a Ukrainian patriot. He went from a socialist realist painter to, you know, um, someone who is uh, maybe a Soviet Ukrainian patriot to a Ukrainian patriot, if you can, if you can put it that way. So it's, um, it kind of worked, this KGB plan in the end. This combination of reward, personal ties, and um, getting him a career as a, as a painter. And it's successful. Um, of course, other people, did not want to, to do that. They complained about the weather, which was kind of a code for everything in the Soviet Union. I know that Buenos Aires is probably nicer than, than Ukrainian winter, if you, if you like that kind of thing. Um, but uh, you know, the KGB understood that as complaining about politics. Um, so after all this pressure from the, from the emigrant community, the re-emigrant community, Soviet officials relented. They issued exit permits for a lot of them. Um, one of them, Vasily Jose Chuiko, got out eventually in 1966, after many years, 10 years of being there. He was one of 865 who left in 1966. Uh, they registered about 1,600 petitions total from just from the Ukrainian uh, Argentinians, yeah. which is about 20% of them. And they were probably more likely to want to leave than, than the other communities. Much more likely to want to leave than repatriates, because repatriates, people who were part of the wartime diaspora, they kind of knew what they were getting into. They had lived in the Soviet Union. They knew that it was going to be kind of like that, the, the place that they had left, but less repressive because of Stalin at time. Um, whereas these re emigres, they imagined this national homeland, economic prosperity, all of this, they didn't get it. So they were more likely to want to leave. Um, this failure creates a broader reconceptualization of what it meant to deal with the emigrant community. This Committee for Return to the Motherland it essentially closes down in 1960, or really it transforms into a, an organization that tries less to bring people back to the motherland than to try to reach out to them. So it becomes Golis Rodini, so Voice of the Motherland, a publication that popularizes Soviet things Soviet um, prosperity, Soviet um, culture, and so on, but doesn't um, only want to bring people back, doesn't primarily want to bring people back. So overall, um, this return campaign started with the premise that Ukrainians and others from the various Soviet diaspora would naturally want to come back to the Soviet Union amid these new political and economic circumstances, that this constellation of, of um, factors would draw them in plus you know, push factors from the capitalist world. And that works in some cases, like, like Alberto Pavlyuk. Um, mostly, though, the diaspora didn't want to, to come back. 
that's what they learned. Even the ones that did come back, and there weren't that many in the end, it was something like 10,000. Um, even those people weren't quite sure about it, and they eventually wanted to leave. The campaign to return would evolve into one that would create connections with the motherland, not to bring them back, uh, but to cultivate a sense of belonging to the USSR uh, through cultural ties rather than return migration. So Soviet officials failed to bring the diasporas to the USSR, so instead they decided to bring the USSR to the diasporas. Thank you. Thank you. There you go, some fine statistics. Uh, all right, good. All right. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, this just raises a ton of questions. I'm going to, you know, I typically, does anyone else want to, do we have any questions from the floor? If you, um, okay, great. And I just want to say, um, if you're listening online and you have a question, please either just raise your hand or drop the question itself in the chat and we can call on you. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah. So, um, hi, I'm Hillary. I'm a second year master's student here. Um, I was curious, I'm not sure if I missed this at the, at the beginning or not, but I was curious if there was any leniency for people, for children, for people who had left as children and returned as adults. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess okay, that's it. Well, what? So, we need to make up with it, I guess. Well, I understand that um, from what diaspora, from you know, just generally, <laughs> yeah, I think in general, um, there was kind of a scale. If you were younger, if you were not an adult when you left the Soviet Union you know, during the war, so someone like Yuri Slipukin would be the author who you know had the autobiographical novel with the girlfriend. Um, he left when he was, I think, 15 or 16, he was taken to Germany as a forced laborer. Um, and there was there was a reason why he was able to become quite successful in the US. Sorry, a novelist, he had a lot of publications. Um, yeah, in general, even with that wartime diaspora, under Stalin, when people were more um, suspected, there was a little bit more lenience towards the younger younger groups. Still, um, if you had been to Germany, if you had been working at a, you know, a munitions factory or, or wherever, it wasn't good for you. Um, you were still suspected of, of being a traitor. Um, like there's one case, a really crazy case, and there's a reason why she gets arrested, um, <laughs> besides you know, having worked as a farm in Germany. But she was, I think, 14 when she was taken. She went to work at a farm in Germany. She met an Italian guy, um, learned Italian enough to present herself as Italian and get on a train to um, to Naples to find this her like, fiance, as she called her boyfriend, right? Um, worked there for a year, came back to the Soviet Union after she didn't like being a maid in Naples, um, became a nurse and they got arrested. Um, even though she had only been 14, I think 18 when she had gone to Naples, very young, um, but it didn't matter. She was still considered a spy. So there were limits to that consideration of, of um, your age not matter, or mattering in terms of uh, whether you suspect or not. Hmm. As a slight follow up question, was there a concern that for people who did leave young that they had been somehow their opinions had changed or they've been, you know, because they've gone and impressionable mm -hmm. that they were had changed too much to have been into the Soviet Union? Or that's like that? I mean that's a really interesting question because it, it ties into the bigger point of this talk, which is that there's this sense that people's national belonging is something is almost biological. Um that once you realize you are Ukrainian or Russian or whatever, that the scales will fall from your eyes and you'll immediately start speaking the language. <laughs> so there, so there's a funny, there's a, a movie, another movie um, called They Have a Motherland, exclamation point. Uh, <laughs> it was written by um, the guy who wrote the Mikhail Senior. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's, a, it's based on a archival case that I've seen where this kid uh, was in Germany, wasn't clear if his mother was alive or not, and a Soviet repatriation officer, they were based in, in the British zones of Germany, says, you should come to the Soviet Union, he's deciding he gets a choice because he's a little bit older. Um, and they say, you know, you belong in the Soviet Union because 
that's where your ancestors were. That's where your relatives were. Or maybe your mother's still there. I don't know. And in the end, you know, he's not willing to go. He's got a German adopted family. And the officer has a last minute effort, says, well, the officers can adopt you. In Germany, you're going to live with the repatriation officers. And then he doesn't go for that. But in the movie, um, the kid goes for it. Right? He doesn't really go for it. He realizes that he is Soviet, that he's, um, I think, Ukrainian. And he ends up going to the Soviet Union because he, you know, like he speaks German before and he's got an accent in Russian. And then, like, when he remembers his mother and the motherland, immediately he's he's Soviet, right? So there's a sense of that inherently children, even if they've been away for a long time, they are, there's something there. Right? There's a core that, that makes them so good. Thank you. All right, we have two questions in the chat. Um, the first that I see is Alexei Kotelvox. Yes, hello. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Yes, and... Uh, you know, reading uh, uh, the main Soviet uh, newspapers and uh, uh, um, uh, magazines uh, of, of late 50s, uh, uh, it seemed like uh, this uh, topic about uh, repatriation was a part of uh, uh, the agenda for internal propaganda. Do you know a good examples of um, the publications, uh, 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 these repatriants memoirs about their way back to the motherland, about their uh, uh, life uh, outside as a separate books. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're, I'm sure that you're, you're right that there was an internal audience as well that's showing that not everything was so good outside of the motherland. And by coming back to the motherland, you know, everyone, it just clicked for everybody. Um, so I'm sure that some of the readers of these newspapers were within the Soviet Union. Slipukin is one of the authors that, that does this. And um, I, I can't name specific authors who uh, are like him, but I know that they put out a, uh, he has a, you know, Slipukin's Chitinya every year. <laughs> like he has like a, a small um, publishing house or something like that. And he, um, and there was a volume pretty large, like maybe 500 pages of writings that collected um, collected those kinds of people. So people who had been abroad, who came back, and then they said, well, things are so much better. Uh, things are so much better in the Soviet Union. So there is something um, like you're saying going on where it's for that domestic audience. All right, thanks. Um, we, have a, we have a message in the chat from um, Carolina Kaziura. Who asks about uh, when it comes to the post Second World War migrations? To what extent did exposure to DP camps have an influence on the decision to return to the Soviet Union? For example, for many Ukrainians, but not only, the camps played an important role for national, if not nationalist, education and ethnic consolidation. And for many of them, returning to the USSR was never an option. Yeah, I think that's right. That these DP camps, if you read the literature on them, they. Um kind of a hotbed of, of national formation. Um, what's interesting is so there's a large group, the dominant group in these DP camps that um, would never consider returning to the USSR. And it's radicalized by the fact that the people who want to return to the USSR do at the beginning. So it really polarizes those groups. Mm -hmm. Some people do um, return and there's a dynamic that happens because those DP camps are so um, anti-Soviet, increasingly so as people who want to return do return, that when you return, you have to explain yourself. You have to say why you didn't return and why you're not one of these Ukrainian or Baltic or whatever nationalists. And the explanations get more and more extreme that you know they kept me there by force, they put me in a basement, you know, they um, threatened me. They told me that if I even talked to a Soviet officer, repatriation officer, that, um, you know, I would be killed or deprived of rations. Um, the Soviet officers play on this too, just kind of an interesting facet that they will um, invite people, they invited people to their office, photograph them, 
as a way of creating a kind of blackmail situation so that you know we'll send our photographs of you with us to the um, the uh, DP camp leaders and now you kind of have to do that because the camps will not be receptive to you anymore. But there's a, a mutual radicalization, I would say, um, whether you are in the DP camps or whether you decide to come back. Mm. The center is not there. There's no one really considering going back until they decide to come back and you really can't, um, can't roll back that decision. All right, so I have a couple of questions. The first is about when you're talking about this sense of belonging or this, um, you know, you said the, the people belong because of their ethnic background. I feel like I am curious about to what exactly it was that both Soviet officers and the people themselves, to the extent that you can gauge it, felt they belonged. At one point, you know, so when you're talking about the, this economic promise or these leftist leanings, um, is it possible to disambiguate the promise of a Soviet belonging from, and this, this sort of builds on the previous question, from a sense that if you're Ukrainian, well, this is where Ukrainians are now. They're in the Soviet Union. So this is kind of where you need to be. Um, I, I, it could very well be both, but, um, and then there's also this question of like, you know, it was very interesting when you raised the, the question at the very beginning, like, why are they doing this? Um, obviously there are, I, you know, from other literature in, in the repatriation, we hear a lot about, you know, the, obvious demographic collapse mm -hmm. and the desire to simply claim as many people as possible. And so by that logic, it doesn't really matter what happens to people once they get back and the failures of the local authorities, um, sort of who cares. Um, but then there's this really, you know, what you're describing about what actually happens to them when they return. And on the one hand, the sort of, ways in which they truly don't fit into the structures of Soviet life in the sense that they're not registered seemingly anywhere, like where they're not registered in places where they could get on those lists for the apartments, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously, I mean, this is a, this is a story that's not specific to, to what you're telling, but it is just mind blowing what you're talking about in terms of these improvements and the way they're not, they're befriending these people. I mean, this is, this is unreal the scale of resources that are being devoted to like following these people to Moscow and telling them, oh, I had a really bad experience with now. Why don't you go try or just build your life here? I mean, this is like, so um, I was hoping you could give us a little more insight into what you think the motivations are, perhaps just in these different Perhaps this is simply a case of, of conflicting administrative burdens, um, but like the KGB still cares, the local authorities don't. Like, what are some of the clashes that we're seeing coming out there? Yeah. So um, let me do the questions in order. You know, I, I think as I talked about, they don't really find that they belong, and so the authorities find that they don't belong as well that, as they thought either. Um, but this you know, Soviet Ukrainian identity. For the authorities, it's for the Soviet leaders, it's integrated. Mm. You no, know, Ukraine is a Soviet republic, mm -hmm. and the Soviet Republic is, you know, comes with a certain number of things, uh, including a national identity. Um, right. But for I mean, there are different levels of belonging as well. For the individuals who return. It's a much more personal story. They're coming back to grandma. They're coming back to you know, Babushka or whatever. They're coming back to their home villages. They're seeing people that they knew a long time ago. Um, some people probably thought of it as tourism. That, you know, like Pavluk, he was not the only one who thought, I'm coming for, you know, a month and then I'm going and then I'm going to leave. Um, so that belonging is much more personal than, than I think the KGB officers thought it was. Whereas for 
um, state officials, it's much more of a or top down kind of a line that their category in the um I want to say spreadsheet they didn't have spreadsheets but you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. like their identity card says Ukrainian yeah they belong in and, and it and if you read the um the lists that the KGB produced it always says you know where's John's from this is it it doesn't say Argentina even for someone like Pablo right? who was born there who was born Argentina. in Argentina yeah, he was made into a Soviet citizen. And so, is that a biological line of descent? Is that a her Is that heritage? You know, I wondered about this because, um, yeah, it's a common. I don't think they define it either biologically or culturally. It seems to be more cultural, or that it's through your family, but it's not necessarily because it's been a biological ties, but it's some kind of inherited thing mm -hmm. that you inherit from being mm -hmm. around others. Mm -hmm. The other aspect of it is that there's a really pragmatic side of it, mm -hmm. that the national angle is one that produces the most people. You know, as you said, the, especially after the war, they want to get more people. Mm -hmm. This repatriation campaign is a loser in terms of people. It's not good. Like it's, it costs a lot. There, and I'll explain in the second question why that, mm -hmm. um, why they want to do it. But it's a loser demographic. Mm -hmm. Like demographic, you know, the calculus is bad. Mm -hmm. After World War II, the calculus is really good because the Soviet Union, Soviet authorities expect that they can get that half million people back on the ethno-national argument once the Western allies get tired of, of keeping up the DP camps. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of thinking that, well, eventually, you know, Americans are going to want to say that they don't want to pay all this money for yeah. maintaining these people. And we'll get them. Um, or these people get tired of being in Germany when they can't, you know, eat American rations. Um, so there's there's a way that that pragmatic angle is also ideological and they feed into one another. Now, um, you know, what's the logic of why do they want these people? You know, the main reason is that they're these intermediaries between the capitalist world and the uh, socialist world. Mm -hmm. So they come back to the Soviet Union, and they're supposed to go on the pages of the poor return to the motherland, this um, newspaper, and say, you know, Cold War over, the Soviets won. Okay, it's so much better here. Um, it's, like I said, a demographic loser. They're not getting a, a whole lot out of people. Some of them do become pretty good um, professionals, like uh, the daughter of the guy with the motorboard. She becomes a... Like high level translator, eventually she emigrates, but works in the Soviet Union in the TV industry for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and Pavlyuk, it's a success story where he becomes a good painter, or, you know, I don't know if you like that kind of art, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah good. I do. Um, <laughs> but as a demographic, you know, it's, I don't think the calculus there is very good. Mm, but the idea here is that it's going to be a propaganda win that you can. Um, ultimately show that the Soviet Union is successful. It's a, um, and what's most interesting is the KGB is acting, you know, they have a broader purview than the local officials, if that makes sense. Absolutely, They're, but I think that one of the things that's so interesting is that you're showing us the um, total interpenetration of real and fictional. Yeah in efforts to concoct stories that will be used on the pages. Why not just make those up? So, right, you know, right, it, right. It, I mean, it's a very interesting right. commitment to realism yeah, in absolutely. this way that's underpinned by subterfuge and underpinned by KGB activity. Um, I mean, just bouncing off that point, I think it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting you say that because, um, the, you know, it's a big difference from the, the Stalin period. Yeah. When there's so much falsification that there really is a, a commitment to <laughs> that is really interesting. some kind of realism that you, like, why not just have Dimitri tell uh, Pavluk, you know, Alberto, that, you know, it's, it's just not working out. Why did he have to go there? Yeah, why can't like, he, like, he just arrest him? Yeah, and I think that 10 years before, if those people had come back, of course, they didn't come back 10 years before right. because Stalin right. But if they had come back 10 years before, they would all have been deported. 
Okay. You know, Stalin's regime knew what to do with those kind of people. Yeah. It was to send them to a special settlement. Right. Um, and in this thought period, they can't do that. They don't feel like they can do that, especially because these people are intermediaries. They have second passports. They can go to the Canadian embassy. They can go to the Argentinian embassy. Um, they can figure out ways to write letters. You know, they, the reason one of the reasons they go to the Spanish sailors is they send letters with right, Spanish speaking sailors. Um, some of them are so naive too. They think they like so we so we uh, you know KGB has all the all the abilities to watch them all the time. And the thing with Pavuk is crazy because they're watching him every second. Like he's, you know, he goes up to Kiev and he's one you know, over his shoulder. They got people everywhere watching him, like putting in a letter to the embassy, um, which didn't get there. Uh, <laughs> but um, so they write in Spanish, thinking that the KGB can't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. But the, I mean, but they always find ways around it. You know, there always are ways if you're not willing to just deport them and to put them in prison camps. There's always ways that they can get out and send information out. Um, and I think that's the real, I mean, one of the bigger points of the book overall is that mm, a lot of these migrants didn't have a lot of power, especially in the post-war, immediate post-war period. You know, they didn't have passports, they didn't have food, they didn't have belongings. They were really reliant on people with guns and, and food and all sorts of things. But their status between states gave them a kind of leverage mm -hmm. because they could choose, they could vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. And under Stalin, that, that leverage isn't very much. It's something. It actually does give them something. But it's not much. Under Khrushchev, the leverage goes up quite a bit because they really are committed to um, some kind of real battle against Capitalism on the terms of you know, way of life, quality of, of life. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, I, I think um, that's what the KGB is going for. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. It's like this pursuit, the pursuit of authenticity yeah. within the KGB and how they try to do it. It's obviously not ultimately authentic, but they're but it's infiltrating it like yeah. in different ways, if that makes sense. Anyhow, so we have a question here. Um Where's sorry. The back to Oh, so the first question was not from Carolina Kaziora. It was Natalie Zelensky's no, question. The first one's Carolina. The next one that I sent is from Natalie. The third one is from Yanni. Got it. All right. <laughs> so the next question is from Natalie Zelensky. Do we have a rough breakdown of the percentage of returnees who've been born in the Soviet Union or pre-revolutionary Russia, for that matter, and those who've been born, quote, abroad? But to Russia or Russian-speaking parents, can this breakdown be further specified by country? Um, and then there's a third question that, that, from a different person. Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is, is no. It's, there are limits to the data that, um, that the KGB gathered. It's pretty crude. Mm. Um, you can tell where their point of departure was. So it says, you know, Alberto Pavluk, born in Argentina, Came from Argentina, citizen of the USSR, <laughs> right? Came this date, arrived this place, and it's so um, it's so crude that sometimes you can't even tell where they came from because it says that they arrived from like, Kazakhstan, so they mm -hmm. arrived in Ukraine from Kazakhstan. But where did they come from? Well, probably yeah. China, right? Probably from um, Carmen. Carmen. Yeah, but um, the short answer is not really. I wish we could, you know, ultimate data, but. Um, but there are limits. Um, okay, then, then from Yana Lusenko, is that right? Yes. Okay, so you mentioned that some of the returning emigres were quite unhappy to return, but how well did these people reintegrate in general when they returned? How did the local communities perceive them, and were there tensions in these communities? I mean, it depends on what generation of returning we're talking about. The ones that I talked about today, I think they were really happy to return until they came and they saw what it was like. Um, the local communities, it differed. Some communities were, were happy to um, help. It depended mostly on personal ties. Um, so we, you know, that family of 15 that comes back to their village, my sense is they did okay because mm -hmm. they came to their whole village. Or um, there is this 
repatriate couples who came from Belgium. The husband was Belgian. Uh, she was not. Uh, they came with a kid who didn't speak Ukrainian. It's kind of a mess. Uh, but they get an apartment and they rely on their parents or on her parents. And they, they kind of make it work. And they use their leverage to get more stuff as well. Um, yeah, it just depends on the community. But if they didn't know people in the area, then it becomes a problem. Because those local officials, there's a lot of people tugging it at their sleeves, trying to get, get something out of them. Um, and so the uh, returnees, so the uh, returnees of the 50s, have to get more powerful people to intervene on their behalf, like the KGB or like the party, or by going near to the embassy and, and trying to, to um, alert authorities that way. Now, the, um, the post-war, you know, immediate post-war group, it really depended. Um, in general, I mean, I think the dynamics are not, not too dissimilar, though. In general, if people had local communities, if they had families that could take care of them, find them a job, were willing to um, ignore that they were a repatriate, they, they kind of trusted them and knew that, um, well, didn't care that that person could be arrested. You know, not all of them were arrested, not even most of them were arrested, but there was more of them were arrested than ordinary Soviet citizens. So there was a risk. You had to have a, a trust network with people. Um, those who were not, didn't have a good network, tended to do less well, that they could be fired from their jobs, if, even if their bosses liked them, their boss might say, you know, a party official from Moscow came and asked if we had people from Germany who had been working in Germany in our, uh, in our factory, and I had to say no, which means that you don't work here anymore. That sort of thing. It happens a lot um, in, the, in the 40s, in the late 40s. So, I mean, that was a, a long version of that answer. But in general, personal connections really matter, as I didn't expect in the, yeah. in the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, there was. Uh, yes. Uh, do you have any stories uh, from this community in New York City, maybe, or uh, more oh. broadly uh, from the United States? Are there particular areas where this campaign was successful? You know, I know that some people came back from the United States, but I didn't see that many people who. Um, who showed up on the on the radar of this, the police. And I think the reason for that is that those people knew what they were getting into. So not that many, um, the people who came back from the United States were mostly not from the immigrant community. I think they were mostly repatriates. So people who were part of that war diaspora. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, I have some stories from Western Europe, from Canada. Um, but yeah, not not very many from the United States none that really come to mind, unfortunately. Um, thank you. So I'm interested about um, Poland. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something very interesting to me is that uh, actually some of these people, uh, it seems to have a little bit quite complicated understanding of citizenship, because as you said, at least like one of the person claims that they belong to Poland, on the grounds that like their families were like born in or like themselves. So they were born like in this like interwar, like Ukrainian, Ukrainian territories that belong to the Poland. So I'm curious about kind of this complication because it seems that it's kind of it kind of creates kind of another case in your story. How those people like what concept of citizenship and belonging they had at the time. So that's kind of like one part of my question. Like another question, so do you know about any attempts made by socialist Poland to claim those people as their own people, it kind of like to reach to uh, to kind of the, those who were born on that uh, like territory that belonged to Interwar Poland, and kind of say, okay, so it's like those are people who are kind of our citizens, kind of you know like a competing project like, yeah. with the Soviet Union, like what's like what the Soviets were doing. Yes. Um... No, it's a good question, and it kind of ties into what Anne was asking yeah. about earlier yes. um, in, in an interesting way. 
one of the differences between the migrants themselves and the and Soviet authorities' conceptions of belonging, it wasn't just, you know, do they belong to this state or that state or, um, you know, is it mixed? But another dimension is the firmness of belonging. How, mm -hmm. um, how malleable is belonging overall? Mm -hmm. Can people have multiple entries in their passport or, or can mul multiple passports, right? Can they, you know, feel affinity for Argentina or Poland as well as Ukraine? As well as the Soviet Union, right? To what extent is there that flexibility? Soviet authorities would say, "No, you are one thing. You can't be more than one thing. Anything, any attempt to be more than one thing is basically a ruse." Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they're wrong in some cases. I think some people were using nationality pragmatically, as a lot of people do in this mm -hmm. period and, and in the Warthin period as well. But um, some people probably did feel. You know, mixed affinity. Like, I, um, you know, to use my personal life. Like, I lived in, I grew up in the United States. I moved to Canada for graduate school, and I lived in Russia for a long time um, at higher school that comes. And I have affinities with all of those places, and I have family ties to a lot of those places. Um, so, you know, when I moved back to Florida, it was very strange. <laughs> I got back to Florida when I moved to Florida. Very strange, not only because it's um, Florida, and I know this has been recorded on for, for YouTube. So <laughs> let me just preface it. I love living in Florida. Gators. Uh, no, seriously. Yeah. Uh, but it was very strange to feel like an outsider in a country where the only country where I have a passport, and to feel less of an affinity for Florida than I did for Moscow at the time. Where I lived for seven years at that point. Um, and so I think we have to take seriously those people who claim that they were actually Polish, or that at least part of them was could be considered Polish. They had family there. Um, and competing projects. So Poland at this time, I don't know a lot about this project, uh, about this campaign. I, my understanding is that the only research that's been published on it is in Polish. And I am relying on a, um, a Polish colleague, Speak Wynowski, who me into this. Um, there's a population transfer in the mid-1950s where Polish people are invited or encouraged or pushed out of the Soviet Union um, to Poland. Uh, and the Polish consulate in or embassy in Ukraine is quite eager to, to get them. But the reason that the Soviet authorities don't seem that scared about these Ukrainian Argentinians is because it seems like there's more control over the Polish embassy than there is over the Argentinian embassy. So if one of these um, migrants from Argentina goes to the Polish embassy in Kiev and says, I am Polish, someone from the KGB can tell, uh, can tell the Polish embassy they're really not. Mm -hmm. So there's no, no fear there, where they can't say the same thing to um, Argentina. Yeah. All right. Well, Seth, I want to thank you for this fascinating talk. I can't wait to read the book. Everyone go buy the book. <laughs>